Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration, and information on writing, publishing options, and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint, and lots more information at thecreativepen.com. And that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello, creatives. I'm Joanna Penn, and this is episode number 638 of the podcast, and it is Friday the 29th of July 2022 as I record this. In today's show, I'm talking to Sasha Black about lessons learned from three years as a full-time author. We discuss what to have in place before making the jump, building confidence and multiple streams of income, as well as learning to say no, which I still struggle with. (laughs) self-care, authentic branding, and how you can discover your voice over time, as well as how to be a better publisher. So Sasha also has a new book out this week, The Anatomy of a Bestseller, Three Steps to Deconstruct Winning Books and Teach Yourself Craft. And yeah, we talk about lots of this coming up in the interview section. So in publishing news, Publishers Weekly reports this week the US Department of Justice's bid to block Penguin Random House's acquisition of rival Big Five publisher Simon & Schuster is ready for court. The arguments are due to begin on August 1st, which is when this goes out. Publishers Weekly says the closely watched case holds major implications for a publishing industry that has been grappling with consolidation for years and looms as a key test for the government amid growing calls for a more vigilant antitrust enforcement. So it says, basically, if allowed to acquire Simon & Schuster, PRH would be by far the largest book publisher in the United States, towering over its rivals, with revenues more than double its next closest competitor. And with that kind of scale, the publisher would wield outsized influence over who and what is published and how much authors are paid for their work. Now, what's hilarious about this article, I find, is that they say they hone in on the advances of a very small subset of authors earning advances over (laughs) $250,000. And they say such a reduction in author compensation would lead to fewer authors being able to make a living from writing and ultimately fewer and less diverse books being published. So while I can see some really good points in this, the fact that they're homing in on authors who get advances over 250,000 is kind of crazy. That just seems ridiculous because as we've discussed many times before, that is not normal for probably 95 to 99% of authors <laughs> are not getting that kind of advance. So yeah, I don't know if they're going to base their discussion on that, then uh, I can't see that winning really. But of course, that's my opinion that it's not the publisher's weekly thing. PRH lawyers argue that the government's case misunderstands the most basic elements of the book rights market. <laughs> which again, I probably agree with in this case, like books themselves, book deals are individualised and winning bids are subject to myriad factors, all managed by an agent, a sophisticated player in the market. Post-merger, authors will still have a wide array of buyers to bid on their work, including the other three big four publishers, Hachette, HarperCollins and Macmillan, media heavyweights like Amazon, Disney, Scholastic and a whole load of other things. And of course, there's always self-publishing. And in registering its opposition, the Authors Guild, among the most vocal critics of the deal and of industry consolidation in general, went after the industry's true monopsony, Amazon, saying Amazon's grip on our industry is the ultimate cause of the recent drive toward further consolidation. And without antitrust reform and the political will to take on Amazon, quashing the proposed PRH Simon & Schuster merger will prove too little, too late. And that is as reported on publishersweekly.com, which has always got some interesting stuff that goes on. So far, so big trad pub players playing big games. And you might be wondering, well, what's that got to do with me? (laughs) Well, first of all, many listeners are traditionally published and they're probably authors listening who are with PRH, Penguin Random House or Simon & Schuster imprints. If this deal does go through, inevitably there will be, as there have been on so many of the other mergers that I've mentioned over the years, (laughs) over the many years, there will be consolidation, cost cutting. Some imprints will go or be merged together. Editors will go. 
there'll be a lot of orphaned authors who want to go indie. They're probably books that will get sort of ditched because they're in the middle of the merger. And there'll be a whole lot of new editors and cover designers who will go freelance, as we've seen before. That's when we've seen some of our biggest wave of um, yeah editors and cover designers coming into uh, freelance is when these mergers go through. Someone is going to buy Simon & Schuster, so it's just a case of who and when and what the fallout is. And again, when this stuff happens, it is whether, whether you are purely indie, um, you know, you're probably going to have contracts at some point. And this is about intellectual property, whether these are foreign rights deals, whether these are um, film TV deals, uh, wh- whatever you want to sign, <laughs> you need to be aware of what might happen. If you're in these companies, check your contracts. So what would happen if you are, if you're, if the company that publishes you is bought? Do any of the rights revert? Is there a clause for when this happens? And look, to be honest, this happens all the time. Companies get bought. Now, if you were happy with your original deal, but then things change because of a merger, does that, do you have any power in that situation? All of these are questions for hundreds of thousands of authors with presumably millions of books that are part of the intellectual property wrapped up in this sale. And of course, the valuation of these companies is based on intellectual property as well as probably revenues. So uh, yeah, I think these are always really interesting things to watch. And of course, everything changes for traditionally published authors, for indie authors, for readers, for us as writers. And of course, the uh, economy right now (laughs) is generally not great. So change is indeed the only constant. And we have to keep a long term view, which, as you should know by now, if you've been listening regularly, is all about owning and controlling your intellectual property, selectively licensing it to achieve your goals. As ever, please do sign contracts, but please do know what you're signing. And uh, of course, as ever, writing the next book. So we shall see how this shakes out. So in my personal update, if you listen to my books and travel podcast, you will know how much I love long walks and also pilgrimage. And in September 2022, a month away as I record this, I will be finally walking my Camino de Santiago along the Portuguese coastal route from Porto in Portugal up to Santiago de Compostela in uh, north-western Spain. So this week, (laughs) things started to get real as I have booked my flights and accommodation at either end and started to go through the route on the map looking at the kilometres per day and all of that. I'm also writing, working on my pilgrimage memoir and have basically decided to include three pilgrimages in it as they have a similar arc and it will include aspects of the Pilgrim's Way which I did uh, two years ago from Canterbury to London, the St Cuthbert's Way from Melrose to Lindisfarne which I did uh, last year and then the Camino and my goal is to get as much written as possible before I leave and then after my Camino I'll be able to shape the material with what happens on that trip (laughs) but as ever these pilgrimages cannot be predicted and the lessons we learn while walking so far are yeah you, you you can't you can't think about this too much in advance because I, I feel like pilgrimage is all about breaking down your ego, <laughs> breaking down your body and your ego until all that's left is someone who just walks every day. And uh, it's a simple life. And yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. Actually, I, I need to reset uh, things. And so that will be very interesting. And if you want to go to uh, the, my books and travel podcast, I have had lots of episodes on pilgrimage. And if you, uh, I've, I've put a link in the show notes to a whole load of pilgrimage episodes. So you can see that. And I, I have transcripts there and photos of all these different things. So that's books and travel podcast, if you want to have a listen to some. And of course, I will be doing an episode at some point uh, before the end of the year on what happens on this next one. Also, I have read a book this week, which I think you'll uh, enjoy, which is Stephen Pressfield has a new book out, Put Your Ass Where Your Heart Wants to Be, (laughs) which is a a great title. Steve has been on this show multiple times over the years, and I particularly love his book Turning Pro, which is always a challenge. Uh, But although I know his work really well, I know what he says about a lot of things. I always feel like a book from Steve gives me a good kick up the ass. And this one does that as ever. It's about commitment to the writing practice, about writing even when things are tough. And let's face it, it's almost always tough in some form, whether it's 
physical issues, mental issues, financial issues. There are so many issues. (laughs) Here's a quote from the book. Leave your ego, leave your greed, leave your competitiveness with your comrades, leave your lust for glory and your fear and your self-doubt and your lack of belief in yourself. Leave everything but your will to victory. And in that context, the victory is about getting your words done and overcoming resistance for another day. So yes, that is put your ass where your heart wants to be. It's a very American title. (laughs) Also, how to write a novel. The audio book is now available on audio. And in fact, it should be on all the audio retailers. And um, I've had lots of wonderful comments and pictures from people getting their print copies. Thank you to Dr. Jimmy Aaron Kepler, who sent a lovely picture of himself holding the book. He said, bought How to Write a Novel from the website. It made it to Texas in under two weeks. I'll buy direct from her again. The product is awesome and supporting her is worth a few days wait. So thank you, Jimmy. I really appreciate that. And I was quite worried about the shipping to the US and also to Australia, because I know this, or some Australians have bought it. Uh, in the UK, people were getting the book within a couple of days. But the US I was like, I know it's, they said 10 working days, which is essentially two weeks. But Jimmy, thank you so much. And you're exactly right. It is going to be a wait and also some shipping cost. But I appreciate that. Also, thanks to Emily Pittman, who also sent a lovely photo with the book and just a huge smile. And thanks to husband Mark, patron Mark, who bought it for her. Emily said, it's such a beautiful book. The feel, the layout and the colour. I can't wait to dive inside. And Mark said, it cracked me up that I giddily encouraged Emily to say, turn to the title page. It's in (laughs) colour. And yes, as I've mentioned, I use uh, I'm using Book Vault, and uh, I'm able to do one color pay, or I can do as mu- much color as I like. But um, for many of the print on demand, it's either black and white or color, and so I was able to do a color page. So the uh, title page is color, and so it feels like a special edition, which is awesome. Thanks also to other people for emails and tweets uh, and comments this week. H.R. Kemp left a comment on the Tess Gerritsen interview. Thank you for the interview. I'm thrilled to see Tess write a book about older, mature women as the main character. Uh, My latest book also has an amateur uh, sleuth mature woman and I wrote what I wanted to read but couldn't find. Maybe it's the beginning of a new trend. Indeed. And finally, Kev Partner left a comment on the show notes about Jerry Riddle uh, saying he has a lot more patience to invest so much time in his first book with the aim of making a bestseller. My approach was to write the best book I could at the time and move on knowing I'd improve each time. Mind you, I don't make anything like the money Jerry does. (laughs) I am the same. And uh, Kev says, as Jerry says, know your strengths. And indeed, I really enjoyed talking to Jerry. So remember, you can tweet me at the creative pen with a double N. Send me pictures of where you're listening to the show. Uh, or oh, indeed, holding one of my books. That would be lovely. Email me, joanna at thecreativepen.com or leave a comment on the blog or the YouTube channel. I love to hear from you. It makes this more of a conversation. So today's show is sponsored by Publisher Rocket by Kindlepreneur, which is appropriate as Sasha and I talk about being a better publisher. And of course, choosing categories and keywords is an important part of metadata that people use to find your books. And if you've been doing this a while, you probably need to update them. Plus, you can find a great formatting tool for your book description at kindlepreneur.com. So what is Publisher Rocket? Well, Publisher Rocket helps you with keyword and category searches on Amazon, which you need for your metadata and your advertising. It also generates lists of keywords for your Amazon ads. Plus, you can use it for researching where a book might fit. So, for example, I have been using Rocket to research the travel genre, solo walking, pilgrimage, the Camino subgenre of walking memoir, which is its own thing. (laughs) But it, and it is quite funny because you can also have a look at how much money different books are making. 
<laughs> what I would say is pilgrimage is not a very high earning category, but sometimes we just have a burning in our soul to write these kind of books. But yes, you can do brilliant research with Rocket and you can also see what kind of covers are selling well, what um, books to include in your various targeting. And yes, of course, you can manually spend the time on Amazon doing this, but it takes a lot more time and you have to think about all the different permutations to search for. So Publisher Rocket saves you time and frustration in your research. It makes it easy, uh, which let's face it is what we need so we can get back to writing. You can also switch the store. There is US, UK and Germany now. So you can analyse the competition in different places. And of course, remember, you can have different categories on different country stores. So if you just have keywords for the US, you can, uh, sorry, categories for the US, you can also email Amazon and ask them to put you in different categories in the UK. So remember, you can list 10 categories per format of book on Amazon, but you can only put, um, what is it, two in the uh, publishing and then you have to email them. But you need to find those 10 and Publisher Rocket helps you discover them when you're first publishing or if you want to change up categories and keywords over time. And of course, back to ads, they do have a uh, an AMS keyword search. So you can type in a keyword like pilgrimage or vampire romance and then download lists of keywords for your ads. Publisher Rocket is one of my must use tools as part of my publishing process and it is very reasonably priced. So go check it out at publisherrocket.com. So this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing. But my time as ever, especially with the in between episodes like last week's blockchain episode, is sponsored by my wonderful patrons. So thanks to new patrons this week, Shirley Day, Moose, Dino Manrique and Anne F. Haag. So thanks to everyone who's been supporting this show on Patreon for months and years and many of you who submit your questions to the monthly Q&A, which I will obviously be doing for August uh, in the next couple of weeks. So if you support the show at patreon.com, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash the creative pen, you will be able to support the show. You get the extra monthly Q&A audio and you get kind of behind the scenes stuff like my patrons helped me with the uh, Shopify store and they got uh, a discount on things. And yeah, I hope that some of you might consider supporting me as we go forward towards episode 700, which just seems kind of crazy. But uh, yeah, I'm still going. (laughs) Right, let's get on with the interview. Sasha Black is an author, rebel podcaster and professional speaker. She writes educational non-fiction books for writers and sapphic books for young adults. Welcome back to the show, Sasha. Thank you for having me. It's always a massive, uh, sort of giddy honour and pleasure to be here. So thank you. Oh, well, it's great to talk to you again. So you were last on the show in March 2019, talking about writing heroes and villains, and you left your job a couple of months after that. So I wanted to start by, you know, take us back to how you made that decision. What were you doing before and why did you decide to make the jump? So I think my decision to leave the day job is probably a little bit different to a lot of writers who are very keen on leaving just to purely write books, whereas I really didn't like my day job. I was very low and I like didn't fit. I was really creative and wanted to do quirky projects and they just were not interested. So I felt very crushed in the day job. I was kind of doing project management in a conservative environment. So that was a lot of the reason that I was pushing to leave my job and then also I'd had a threat of redundancy and at the time I lived in a property that was owned by my employer so if I lost my job I would also lose my house and it's this you know being completely beholden to one other organization or one person and it was terrifying so I was very 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 determined to leave my job so (sighs) I mean, why did I make the decision and how did I kind of get there? I had to do a few things before I left. 
I had to pay off debt. So I still had student debt. I had a car loan and like some fertility treatment and stuff. And my whole ethos was that I wanted to to need as little money per month as humanly possible. So of course, paying off the debt was the quickest way to do that. And that drastically lowered the amount of money that I needed, which made it easier to leave my job because the less I needed, the less I had to guarantee to come in from from writing or freelance or whatever. But I also left knowing that I had an unsatiable appetite for like all of the things. So I knew that I wanted to write books and speak and do teaching and all of the rest of the stuff. So I I left probably a little bit before a lot of writers would leave if they are leaving just to write books. And what got me to that point was that I had paid off all of the debt and I needed like it was a lot less, like maybe, I don't know, a thousand pounds less every single month. And then I had built up some freelance work. So I did like virtual assistant work. I had gotten qualified as a developmental editor. And I'd also built a pot of money, like a safety net. So that also like went into the decision that I knew even if I did have a rubbish month, I would be okay because I had some money backing me up there. And then I got offered a freelance gig which was sort of long term and really made up the gap between what I was earning from sales and courses and what I don't know, whatever else I was doing back then and what I needed to earn. So, yeah, like that was kind of what led me there. It was a, it was a tough choice because I did half my income. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think there's a few things there. Listeners know I left my job over a decade ago in 2011. But similar to you, downsizing, I think this is such an important thing. And so I wanted to emphasize it. So you paid off debt. We did the same thing. Like we sold our house. We also lowered our costs and we also had a safety net. And I know some people don't have a choice because they are made redundant and then Mm. they kind of have to start from nowhere. But if you have the choice like you did and I did, which is paying off the debt, lowering your monthly costs and at least having some savings so that if it doesn't turn out exactly as you think, then that's really good. So let's come on to that first year because I know I remember emailing you about this but t- tell us about that first year both I guess you, you've already said you took a pay cut but yeah. the emotional side as well and what should people know and what might make it easier for others who are thinking about it or are in that first year I mean my first question is like do you like roller coaster rides <laughs> the really really fast ones because Oh my goodness me. I I do. I remember the conversation that we had and you, I think you said something along the lines of, oh, you'll be like a duck, like on the surface, you'll look okay. And then underneath you're like scrambling and pedaling so fast. Like, oh, it, that is exactly what it was like. That whole year felt like being in a boxing ring with Mike Tyson, because you are just like, the pressure and the constant get up, get to the desk, like how can we earn money today is both intensely thrilling (laughs) and kind of stressful. But I really, really thrive on that. And I think if you like pressure (laughs) and you like being responsible for what you're delivering, then that first year is a bit of a breeze. But to me now, when I look back, it's a complete blur because it was just like survive the day, survive the day. Like we can find another way. Think of a new idea, like do a new thing, experiment here. So like for me, it was about building confidence because I had no idea if I could even make it to the end of the year. And so And also I was a bit of a shell when I left my old job as well. So that year was a little bit about repairing and healing internally. And then the other bit was about building that confidence that I could actually make it to the end of a year Mm. Uh, and like that self-belief. And then it's like a switch, like you get to the end of that first year and you're like, oh, wait a minute, I can actually do this. And then your decision making changes, I think, after the end of that first year. So yeah, in terms of what do I wish I'd known? I wish that I had focused more on long-term creation. I spent a lot of that first year just trying to make money. I didn't care where it came from. I just had to bring in the cash to pay the bills, to pay whatever it was that I needed. And so I definitely didn't necessarily focus on the right things. 
but you need to pay the bills. So, I mean, like you mentioned, you had freelance work, you had editor work. And I mean, I feel like this balance between cash flow and building assets is, mm. it's so important, but equally, when you need the cash flow, you have to do the cash flow. And of course, it's, for some authors, it's keeping a job or like Michael Brent Collings was on here and he said he did pizza delivery for a bit just so he could pay some bills and keep his kids in, in food or whatever. And so I think that's really important is I tell totally agree with you that we would all love to just focus on building (laughs) assets and writing our books but equally it's absolutely fine and brilliant to just make some money to pay the bills and especially like we're talking now going into a difficult financial period for many people with inflation and and I think this is something that people do have to do right is Mm -hmm. is so don't beat yourself up over that and I think even if you had known then I still think you would have been just earning money today. Like, how do we earn money today? This is a very good question. (laughs) It is a good question, especially with like all the tech changing and all the possible, like, but that's the thing, right? My mindset completely shifted because back then I was like, "Um, oh my goodness, like I have no idea how to make money. I just need to do all of the things. Whereas now I'm much more selective and I'm like, well, I could do that and I could do this, but actually what will make me happiest because I am more willing to risk a lower income for a couple of months in order to focus on a thing that is more me, more my brand, lean into what I'm strongest at, if it's going to give me a longer term return. But I didn't have the confidence to do that back then, even with the safety net and the safety pot. And I do think that that first year was all about building that confidence and learning, like, because I did so many different things and just experimenting from editing and VA work and, and I don't know, all kinds of stuff that you have to learn the things that both give you joy and create energy for you and bring in cash because you might find that doing something that brings in slightly less, but actually gives you loads of joy is, is better for you in the long run. Mm. Um, Yeah. So. But I feel, feel like you can only have the luxury of thinking about that once you've at least yeah. got some kind of state stability in, in the income. But let's talk about that. So you talk there about experimenting and you mentioned BA. I presume you mean business analysis if people don't know. Um, Sorry, VA. Oh, VA, virtual, virtual assistant. assistant. Okay, yeah. virtual assistant. Okay, but I mean, you still have multiple streams of income, as you mentioned. I mean, you and I are similar in many ways, but both of us are multi-passionate creators and we can't seem to stop ourselves doing so many different things. But (laughs) tell us about your multiple streams of income now, because you said that you've become more selective. So how does it look now? So when I left the day job and I went back and had a look at the numbers because I knew that you were going to ask me this, 75% of my income in that first year came from freelance or like other stuff. So things like, as I've mentioned, I had virtual assistant work, editing, I did like graphics work, I did uh, editing. Did I say editing? I'm, I'm losing track here. Merchandise, course creation, like obviously books. I did some work for the Alliance for Independent Authors, managing conferences, uh, editing their blog, like all kinds of different things. And then over the last three years, I revised and I revised because uh, through, I guess, like introspection and learning what took the most energy um, gave me X money, but actually drained me so much that I then couldn't work on the stuff that I wanted to. I completely agree that it is a privileged position to to be able to make those decisions. But you get into a dangerous position where if you do too much of one thing, you then can't work on the thing that you want to. And that just creates a job instead of like a business or a career that you really want. So for me, I had to reduce down the editing because my brain it was just taking from the same creative pot. If I was editing, I couldn't, there was nothing left in order to write my own books. And ultimately, mm. <laughs> that's what I want to do. So I had to stop doing that stuff. So, in terms of where I am now, I have only one freelance gig left, which I actually love. So I want to continue because it brings me joy. <laughs> So I'm focusing a lot on community building. I have an amazing Patreon community, which goes, it grows in fits and starts. You sort of, it sort of takes forever to, to begin. And then you bring in a huge quantity of patrons and then it slows again. And then you have a massive expansion, but it's the community, the community. And so a lot of the things that I create have actually come from the community themselves. So we have lives and we talk about the things that I'm doing. And one of the things 
that came from that was that I do a lot of deconstruction of the books that I read and they wanted to do that. So from that came masterclasses. And now I've written a book about how to do that. And then there'll be like a premium course. And so some of it comes from the things that I want to do. And some of it comes from the community and the readership that you build and delivering what they want. So I'm doing courses, I'm doing Patreon, narrating audiobooks. I'm just about to start another one still doing speaking because I love that and that gives me energy and also Mm -hmm. you can then iterate the content as well so just because you've done something once and you've been paid for it doesn't mean you can't reuse it in another way so any like speaking gig that I do I save the content and the slides and then you can iterate it and turn it into something else later down the line and of course writing books that is a big thing (laughs) That I still mm. do, of course. <laughs> yes, it's it. and what tell us about the different types of books that you write. So I spend a lot of my time writing nonfiction. I focus mostly on the craft. So I've written books on characters and prose. And this latest one is on deconstruction and understanding the market and writing to your reader as a, I don't really like the phrase write to market, but your readers are who buy your books. So you need to write to reader. And then I I had a bit of a, uh, you'll forgive the phrase, but like a come to Jesus moment last year where I realized that I was writing in young adult genre, but like, actually I'm a queer woman and the books that I was reading that were giving me the most emotional resonance and the most joy were queer fiction. And I was like, why am I not writing queer fiction. So I have gone on a binge reading exploration of queer fiction. And now I am writing sapphic young adult. And maybe I'll do a pen name with some more adult ah, stuff. Some more <laughs> adult yeah. content. Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. Well, no, that I think that's really interesting. And I think one of the kind of tips here, I guess, for listeners is again, your multiple streams of income. And it's not just from like courses versus books, it's also different genres with the books. And while you're writing a novel that is is because it's touched you in some way and you don't necessarily know that that's going to work in terms of earning but you've got the other forms of income that support you so I guess do do you do you feel like you have more freedom to experiment now because you've got some more stability I guess yes a hundred percent I think there's two things the first thing is I have more stability now and so I do have that freedom to choose but the second thing is I'm going in having done an awful lot of market research. And so I noticed a gap in the market, something that I wanted to read as a reader of that genre, something that was missing. And I've spent an awful lot of time researching the market, researching categories, researching tropes, listening to readers, watching things on TikTok to see what is said, looking at reviews, trying to understand exactly what readers of that genre want. So even though it's not the biggest niche, I'm going in with a lot of knowledge about how to tailor the stories that I want to write in the genre that I want to write, but also delivering what the readers want and expect. So yes, it is still a risk, but I feel like it's an, I don't know, an educated guess, I suppose. Mm. But but yeah, so it, mm. it, it, yeah. No, that's fantastic. So in terms of what are the sort of the good decisions that you've made in the past few years and what are some of the mistakes? I think that one of the best things that I've ever done was leaning into me. I know that probably sounds a bit bananas, but like, I don't, my, my business is not the books. My business is me. I brand me. And I think that is the best decision I ever made because the more you lean into you and whatever the most you thing is. So for me, it's about being cheeky and sarcastic and rebellious and breaking the rules and doing naughty things. You know, the more I have lent into that, the quicker my platform and audience has grown. And Yes, it does mean that sometimes I get one star reviews of this book would have been great if it weren't for the swearing, you know, (laughs) but also that's great because that means that people who do like that kind of thing are are going to click one by. I remember I got a review that said, what is this? This is as if Deadpool was a professor teaching you writing. And I was like, oh, my God, best review ever. But it was a one star review. Right. And so I actually shared that. (laughs) And it got so That is a good review. Yeah, that's a great <laughs> review. <laughs> but, but like, I genuinely feel like leaning into that and leaning into 
me and branding me and seeding that through both the non-fiction, but also the fiction, which is what I'm doing now. I'm doing fiction that's much more cheeky and on the edge than I have ever done. It it just it, it's bringing people towards me, which means the platform's growing, my followers are growing, my sales are growing. And the other thing that I have done, and <laughs> I can't believe I say this, but is self care. I genuinely feel like <laughs> looking after myself has produced just the best results ever. And the way that I do that, and you talk about this, is more sleep or more quality of sleep, I would say. Exercising, I have struggled for a long time with like writer spread. And then, but I couldn't find anything that would fit uh, my business or like working because I also have a child. And so now I go during the day and I have lost working time, but actually I'm producing more because mentally I'm better. I'm high off endorphins in the afternoon. So I just like smash work out. And yeah, but like, I did not do that. I just head down and worked, 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 thinking, no, you know, the harder I work, the more hours I do, the more I will produce. And that was such a hard thing for me to accept because like, I just like working, but Mm. it's not actually true. (laughs) I've looked after myself and lo and behold, I'm producing way more and way faster than I ever have before. So that is like a tough lesson that I I have some (laughs) internal conflict over. But yeah. Mm, I think that's so important. And uh, we we all have that realisation too. You literally can't just brute force any career actually. And the problem, one of the problems in inverted commas with working for yourself is that you can be your worst boss. And I mean, I definitely have worked more hours since leaving a job. (laughs) than I ever did in a job because you can't leave it behind and especially as a writer I mean even if we do something that's not technically related that your brain's still kind of doing its thing and every book we're reading for fun is also something else and I mean it is hard to turn off but that physical health thing I think we all reach that point I mean that's the healthy writer that I co-wrote a few years ago that was partly I explored my own health problems in that but it's like if you haven't figured this out by your mid-30s then you are certainly going to suffer by the time you're 40. (laughs) So you have to figure it out, basically. (laughs) You do. And like the thing that you were saying as well, in terms of that switching off, it's so hard when you work at home because it's like (laughs) there's a thread connecting you to the office and it doesn't matter where you are in the house, the office is calling because it's right there. There is no escape. Home becomes work. And yeah, I can see why so many people choose to do an office or like a garden shop office or go and work in a co-working space because it, it does get very difficult to turn off. And especially like with lockdown as well, mm. um, it, it, there was no turning off. There was no escaping the house either. So what else do you do? You don't, you just work. And that's, well, that's what I did for like the last two years. So yeah, I, I'm not surprised that I ended up sort of doing that yeah having a needing to do self-care yeah so I just I want to just come back to something you said earlier because I think people might be interested is that you said I brand me which uh is a great is a great thing you talked a bit about the sort of hallmarks of that sort of being cheeky or whatever but how have you done that I mean have you done that through branding like you use certain photos you do great hair and makeup like <laughs> when you're on video and stuff like that so is is that part of your physical branding and color schemes and your book design and how are you doing that brand me thing I think it's everything so it filters down from how you look online to the voice and tone you use in blog posts or guest articles or talking on podcasts. It is, as you said, the colors and the branding. It's things like usually if I am on camera, I will be wearing branded merch. It's even these subtle things. I went so far as to paint my front door purple. (laughs) I just live and breathe Sasha Black. That is it. But it's it's little things as well. Like I was very uptight about my mailing list for a really long time. And I don't know what I was trying to do, like over deliver or, or just treat it with the importance that it should be treated with. And then I was like, what are you doing? That is not you. Like I'm the sort of person that is 100% authentic, genuine. Like I, I speak to everybody exactly the same, whether I'm in the pub, on a podcast or whatever. And that is part of the branding for me. 
And I wasn't writing emails like that. And then, so in January, I reread Tammy Lebrecht's newsletter, Ninja, and just went, okay, I'm just going to be me. And I, it was an immediate change. So it's like learning to imbue yourself and your voice in everything. So now I write emails with swear words in and like I take the mick out of myself an awful lot, even on Instagram. So like Instagram stories, I'm like cheeky and naughty and I'll just tell stories that are like taking the mick out of my day because that's the kind of humor that I I love. So it is everything, including apparently your front door. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's good. And also you talked there about learning and like you you did that this year. So that's a couple of years after you went full time and even yeah. more years since you started writing. So if pe- people listening, if you don't know who you are as a brand, like most of us don't, you grow into it. And it's that how it feels, right? If it feels right to do it that way, then lean into that. And yeah. if it doesn't, then don't do that. <laughs> Yeah, and I I hate to bring it up, but I'm going to. (laughs) But Clifton Strengths, oh my goodness me, has been such a journey of revelation and like falling in love with the bits that I had shame around. For those people that don't know, Clifton Strengths is a little bit like Myers Briggs. It breaks. It's like a personality profile, and the sort of most well known person who does it in the writing community is Becca Simon. I learned so so very much about who I am. Um, and the language that I use and learning to accept that I am competitive and I do want to win things and you know but that is it's so it's not seen as something a lady should want or whatever I don't know so yeah it's been like a journey of learning who I am and then putting that into everything I say everything I post everything I write and everything I wear I suppose (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I think that's so important. And as you, as we said, you can learn this stuff over time. It doesn't need to be immediate. A bit like your author voice. I feel like there's such an emphasis on author voice, but it, it, I don't think it emerges until you've written a few mm-hmm. books. You mm-hmm. know, I think it takes a few books for us to relax, as you said, relax into who you are and accept those aspects of yourself and just enable them to be real and not to fake it because if you fake it you actually can't maintain that if we're talking about long-term business you cannot fake it for very long before you're like oh I can't do this anymore right yeah absolutely and we but part of that I think is because we spend so long listening to other people and thinking that they're things for want of a better word are the are right you know there's a lot of loud voices in our community and that it's very easy to listen to them I remember you saying it took you five books before you really understood your writing process and I was like oh no we can we can learn it quick well you don't it took me five books as well so <laughs> basically you were right on everything everything oh, yes. you say is right <laughs> eventually I'm right <laughs> Sometimes it just takes longer than I expect. But no, I think I think that's really good. So let, let's just come back to any mistakes you've made. So any sort of big mistakes that you'd like to share or you could frame it as lessons that you had to learn? I think a couple of things. One is saying yes to too many things. Now, I don't think that's a mistake necessarily but I think I said yes for too long. So when you first start out, you have to say yes to a lot of things because part of that is about growing your audience. You go and do free things. You say yes and take on opportunities and you have to because that does build a platform. It helps to sell books. But I think I said yes for too long because it took me so long to realize that I was drowning. And the other thing that I did too much was spend too much time marketing and dealing with admin before I had built enough books. And that is something I'm still trying to get better at, even though I, I don't know, I think I've, I don't know, I've written 17 or 18 books now, but it, I'm at the point where I have come to fully accept and realize that I have to write books first. But I'm saying this with a caveat because there are some people who will pump out books and not do any building and marketing. And that is also a mistake because you you can't just pump books out. You do actually have to build the community of readers and build your mailing list and build all the other things. But it's this very fine balancing act between prioritizing creation 
but also not leaving all the marketing and just doing nothing. So I think I did not get that balance right at the beginning. And some of that was around because I've been full time three years and two of those years were in the pandemic. So Mm. and some of that was about the pandemic because I could get easy wins. And that's really important to me. So I would do things for other people. And I would focus on the admin because I knew I could like bish bash bosh tasks out rather than focusing on words and book creation. But now I don't do that anymore. (laughs) That is something I've definitely stopped doing. And it's surprising no one (laughs) increasing my income. I think we we have to keep learning that lesson <laughs> because because I feel like and it happens to everyone we go too hard on the marketing and or the business side and then we move back into the creation side and then it's almost like a seesawing because something needs doing and something needs focus and then the next project comes along like I'm at the point now where I'm like okay I took my foot off the marketing too much mm-hmm. because I've been busy doing other things and I took my foot off and now I need to put my foot back on again but then that's just also the person I am and I'm as this, as we've said we're quite similar in that we focus on things and get them done and I think that's really important but I prefer project style work mm-hmm. whereas some people can like consistently every day do exactly the same thing where they go into the spreadsheets or whatever and manage their spreadsheets <laughs> or manage the ads. And I just can't do that. I need to almost do it in binge sessions. Yes. Or let's call it campaigns, because that's a marketing term. Doing marketing campaigns as opposed to consistent everyday marketing. I don't know. That I, I do feel like we go back and forwards. But what about you? Because it's about you. <laughs> I am for sure a, uh, a Phoenix person. I definitely burn hot and hard for periods of time and then I crash and burn but what I have gotten better at doing is crashing and burning but changing tasks so a little bit about what you were saying in terms of sometimes you're focusing on marketing and sometimes you're focusing on creation I definitely do that and I am now better and more aware at understanding my energy levels and preventing severe crashes so it does come down to like how many museums have I been to or whatever I don't know how many places have I gone and looked for inspiration how many books have I read how much sleep am I getting how much exercise am I getting and then scheduling in in instead of doing back-to-back editing or instead of doing fiction 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 and then a non-fiction it's fiction non-fiction fiction fiction, non-fiction because though that wave means the crash is less but I had to learn that the hard way by like doing back-to-back things and being like why am I so exhausted (laughs) so yeah I'm the same kind of kind of thing yeah Yeah. you've posted like I I do as well every year a sort of lessons learned from year x and one of your lessons was uh, be a better publisher so why is that important and what do you mean by it and what are you going to do to be a better publisher So (laughs) this is, you know, the thing that I enjoy the least about my job, (laughs) my (laughs) business, but it's also one of the most important things by what do I mean by being a good publisher? I mean, making sure that you are making the most out of every single product or asset that you have, making sure, what does that look like? That looks like making sure you have all of your books in all of the formats. It means making sure that your reader magnets are up to date that you have checked your autoresponders and that they are evergreen and that you don't put a year in there. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's that a I good one. <laughs> Definitely made that mistake. And then got told when it was two years out of date by a reader. Oh! Um, it means things like pushing for foreign translations or updating the back matter when you've published some more books and linking to those books in the back of your books and running sales. Are you capitalizing on the fact that you have a growing backlist? Have you experimented? Have you, have, if your books have always been full price, have you run a sale? Have you done a on the spot sale just for your newsletter? Have you tried building a shop on your website? <laughs> have you tried a box set? Have you updated your keywords or even things? I remember you talked about updating your author photos recently. Oh, maybe not recently, time is a lie, but it's those things that create a slick running system in the background. Um, things also like, is it time to outsource? Do you need to set up a system to make things more efficient, to take some of the administrative weight off your plate? Um, Yeah, like anything 
that is not creation and that is not advertising and promotion to me kind of feels like the publishing side like what are you doing with your books how often have you checked them for being up to date it being an indie author is not just writing books so it's the business side to to me and I think people are going oh my goodness that's exhausting (laughs) (laughs) and I was just listening to you going oh my goodness and I mean the thing is the longer it goes on the more backlist you have the bigger deal this is like Mm -hmm. um you know we were just talking as we record this I am still building my shop of store but hopefully by the time this goes out it will be live at (laughs) creativepenbooks.com yeah so but basically I uh, it feels like a lot of the admin work sometimes and Mm. so the question then becomes so why not get a publisher why not go back to the day job why why continue to do this so why are you still doing this three years later well uh, so I have been told that I have a problem with authority. <laughs> that might be <laughs> that might, that might be part of it. Also, I don't really play well in teams, so that is another part of it. But really, like or like, me- not messing around. One freedom. I I cannot understate the value of freedom and the enormous empowerment and confidence building that that brings and gives you. And the other bit is potential and possibility. When we mentioned at the top of the episode that when I left my job, I halved my income. Well, I have surpassed my old day job income. And that was like a huge, huge moment because before then I wasn't sure I had the capability. I wasn't sure if I was capable of doing that, but having beaten that income, I'm like, oh, there is no cap. Like there is no stopping me. There is no ceiling from which I can't smash through. Whereas my partner, my wife, who is in a day job, does have a ceiling, hasn't had a pay rise in a while because she's in the public sector. And anyway, this is not a political show, but, um, you know, and so that possibility, that potential is addictive. It is, yeah, I don't know. It's like my own personal catnip. And I also really enjoy the pressure of having to make money. And that, and that's not easy. That is also something that not everybody would like or enjoy. But I really like knowing that any risk I take is on my shoulders. And I have made mistakes. I've outsourced things that I shouldn't have. I've made mistakes and lost money on advertising. But also I have surpass my old day job income so for every loss there is a win and all of them are on my shoulders and I like that responsibility that brings me joy it gives me a sense of achievement and even though sometimes I have to do things to make money 80% of my time or even more than that now I would say I get to work on the things that I choose and that is priceless there is no amount of money that could sway me from that although I'm slightly restrained by the school term time it's the ability to travel or go to a museum in the day or and and it's research and tax deductible (laughs) all the things that I love I get to do every single day how amazing is that why would anybody give that up even though it's financially tough Mm, no I mean absolutely I think all of those reasons I do think that being a full-time independent author or author entrepreneur with these multiple streams of income I do think there is a personality that enjoys it and it's so funny because I think back in the day I would have said oh anyone can be a successful indie but I actually think there is a personality Mm -hmm. type and as you've said it is the people who love taking that independent decision and who want the power to sort of go up but look let's face it there's no ceiling on your income but there's also no floor whereas your wife can bring home a monthly Mm -hmm. salary where yes she can get laid off but essentially there's a floor (laughs) and there's a ceiling whereas for us there's no ceiling but there's also no floor there and it goes up and down over time but I think you're right I think the personality type of if you want if you enjoy the challenge and you want that independence, then yeah. And the empowerment, I totally agree with you. I mean, I'm still doing this too, right? (laughs) Exactly. Really, there is a lot to be said about how resilient you are, because I think if you are not a a resilient person, and really you do have to have that conversation with yourself before you up and leave your day job, you have to be resilient. And it is all about mindset because 
you know, well, and you've written a book on mindset, but 80% of getting up and just keeping going is mindset and sheer stubborn determination to take those wins and those losses and turn those losses into a lesson rather than a woe is me. Because if you woe is me, it you're not going to earn any money this month. So um, yeah, I, I love the risk and the potential and the, I just, oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Brilliant. So we haven't even really talked about your podcast. So tell us, oh, yeah. where can people find you? And tell us a bit about your podcast and your books and where you are online. So you can find me at sashablack.co.uk. And that is Sasha with a C, not an S. Um, and the podcast is the Rebel Author Podcast, where I talk to creative people and we tell rebel stories and uh, there is jokes and sarcasm and naughty words. And my books are wide. You can find them anywhere. Just type in Sasha Black. And I'm most active on Instagram, which is at Sasha Black Author. Brilliant. Well, thanks so much for your time, Sasha. That was great. Thank you for having me. So I hope you found the interview with Sasha interesting and that her lessons might help you avoid some pitfalls. Although, to be honest, I think we all have to learn our own hard-won lessons, despite being forewarned. So go to thecreativepen.com forward slash timeline if you want to see my journey, and that has links to my lessons learned, which I've done every year. Sasha's new craft book is also out now, The Anatomy of a Bestseller, Three Steps to Deconstruct Winning Books and Teach Yourself Craft. Coming next week, two episodes around Shopify and Selling Direct. First of all, an interview with Morgana Best, who helped me with my store. And she has a new book out now, Stop Making Others Rich, How Authors Can Make Bank by Selling Direct. So that's the interview coming on the Monday. And I will also be doing my solo show on Lessons Learned. Because, of course, my Shopify store is now live at creativepenbooks.com, where you can buy ebook, audio, paperback and workbook editions with box sets and more formats to come. So in the meantime, happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.